Because of that, it's all fears, that's why we had to think that emergency response action, that's why we connected the money to the city water supply. What we want to do now is go ahead and get rid of this portion. So we don't have that contamination around it towards the residents. Some of the assessment and investigation activities we completed at this site, we conducted direct push electrical conductivity logging. We installed monitor wells. So far, we've installed 30 monitor wells across this site. We've conducted source characterization to identify the geology and extent of contamination back there at Carter. And we're initiating a river intrusion screening. We've sent letters to selected residents. This nutrition screening to make sure that there are no vapors off the acid from this contaminant coming in and breathing space. Electrical conductivity logging is a tool that we use and it relies on the conductivity or how well the soil is able to conduct electricity. Generally, the finer the soil, the easier it is for that electrical pattern to be made. So, when you would expect a fine grain cell to be more conducted on the ground on the right, this is actually the PC log from the site. Do you mind, Jacko? I'll try to speak louder without the echo. Does that help? Yes. Uh, the graph on the right is an PC log that was done at the site. As that log was advanced down from the ground, you can see that it wants to move to the right. That means it's a higher conductive soil, which means it's a finer grain, so more like a silver or clay. And then once we got deeper, the conductivity was much lower, so it's more indicative of the sand. We advanced the monitor wells in the same locations, and it correlates between the two. Where we saw the fine grain on this log, we saw clays in the monitor well, where we saw the Low conductivity on the log, this is where we saw the sands, so we're able to calibrate the EC to the geology of the area. The monitor wells we installed, I know you can't read this. Each log is a set of wells, and we have them spread across the site. We have wells both on the perimeter, here the boundary of that plume, and within the plume. We want to make sure that that plume is not moving after we take all the wells out of use. We want to watch to make sure that that plume is going to be moved to people who are still using the water. Um, we targeted these wells based on the results of the EC logging, as well as the existing well logs from the wells in the area. We're going to use those for long-term monitoring. We're going to be out here at least twice a year, or more often, depending on what we're doing, to make sure that there are no changes in the groundwater contaminant. Our source investigation, we went to the actual area where the dry cleaner was. We used a couple of different technologies. The first one we used is a passive soil gas module. Uh, instead of going in and boring a big hole through the floor to collect soil samples, we were able to drill a half inch hole in the floor, use these modules, and they will allow the contaminant to absorb onto the material. You take that module out, it's the laboratory, it gives us an idea of what's in the ground. That way, when we do go back to drill the big three inch hole, we're not tearing up as much of the floor. This photo is showing one of the locations. That green and green on the floor is where the sewer line was. And that's where the module was installed right by the sewer line. To install it, there's a gentleman using a hammer drill to drill through the floor. They use a half inch hole and just drill it down. And it goes into the ground, leave it there for about a week, two weeks, and then they pull it out. The actual module that they use is at the bottom center. Looks like a little white shoe string, about 12 inches long. It's proprietary. We don't know what exactly is in there, but it comes from more industries. So the white part is actually a vortex membrane. So if there's any moisture in the ground, it won't affect the samples. The results are on the right hand side. Generally, the more red or purple in color, the higher amount of contaminant there is. The yellows and green is a lower amount. So on the top, looks like there's a lot of contamination. But on this bottom one, you can see the contamination is generally over in this corner of the dry cleaner. 
After we got that information, we then would go back and we actually collect those soil samples. We located soil samples generally in the same area as those passive modules because we saw so much contamination. Took the samples out of the ground, sent them to the laboratory. What came back is the only detections we had were right from that area on the west side of the world. What we think happened is the sand backfill around the sewer line allowed those vapors from the contaminant to move laterally underneath the building and basically saturate the soil with the contaminant. But the actual contaminant itself was only on that west side. That brings us to the vapor intrusion estimate. That contaminant wants to evaporate whether it's the portion that's dissolved in the water or the free product phase, it wants to evaporate and those vapors are going to move through the soil. Some cases, there may be a fine gray layer that causes those vapors to move around it. Other cases, those vapors can come up until it hits an obstruction like a basement or somebody's slab. Those vapors can generally build up underneath that basement to find those weak points, whether it's a crab, or a seam where the footing went to the floor, or a sump, it can actually come into the breathing space. This can be influenced based on the use of air conditioning, or heating, as well as wind blowing over a house. That wind creates a little pressure, very, very little pressure inside the house, okay? but it's enough that it can actually cause those vapors to come into the house. Because of that, working with a consultant to develop a vapor intrusion assessment, we've identified 15 residences. This is that area generally southeast of the dry cleaner, between the dry cleaner and the railroad tracks. And those residences are selected to be representative of the construction styles in the area. We're going to have some that are basements, some that are slab upgrades, some that are crawl spaces. What we want to do is collect samples from those representative residences and see if there was enough of an issue to collect samples from all of the residences. Uh, there's 110, 120 residences in that area, so we're going to collect 15, and what those 15 tell us will tell us whether or not we need to go back and do more sand. Uh, we are working on getting access agreements. If you live in that area, if you have an access agreement, we ask you to please send that back to us. Jesse Graham, our project manager, and Ben Martin, they both have copies of the access agreement, so if you wanted to sign them tonight, you can do so. Once we begin the investigation, the first step is to go into your home and do a building survey. We want to look and see what there might be inside your residence that could be a source of contaminant vapors. Just like everybody who walked in tonight smelled that mineral spirits from the new gym floor tonight, there are things in your house that can actually cause those very low level contaminants. We want to make sure that what we find is representative of what's coming from contamination, not coming from items in your house. After we complete the building survey, we're going to collect both indoor air and self site samples. Um, send those to the laboratory. Once we get those back from the laboratory, we'll meet with each of the owners and go through what those results mean, and we'll complete mitigation if it's necessary. The equipment we're going to be using on the left hand side is a sewing canister. This is an evacuated cylinder. So, this is under vacuum, bring it in your house. There's going to be a regulator on the top. It allows the sample to be collected over 24 hours. For the sub slab sampling, unfortunately, we're going to have to drill a hole in the slab, small about an inch diameter hole. Now we're going to install what's known as a vapor pin. It's this brass pin, it's got a rubber with a slip of steam on it. And we'll use that to collect those vapors from underneath of the slab. Once we're done, we'll either leave these vapor pins in place and come back to them periodically, or we will have them removed and then not before that. If a residence has high enough concentrations that we need to do vapor mitigation, it's the same exact equipment as we use for radon. Uh, if you base it as a sump in it, we would seal the sump. If it's a crawl space, a 
large plastic barriers that we put down is going to be sealed to the walls, sealed to any type of foundation supports. And underneath that plastic, you can barely see the white pipe there. There's a pipe with a bunch of holes in it. We'll connect that to that fan to remove the barriers. Either one of those is going to have a vent on it from the sump pump or underneath the plastic. It goes outside to a fan and it goes out to the atmosphere above the roof. For our source area, where we will have two objectives, first thing we want to do is be protective of human health. That's our primary concern. We also want to make sure whatever remediation we choose is going to effectively reduce the contaminants in the soil and groundwater, as well as be technically and economically feasible. The whole point of tonight's meeting is to give you an idea of what we're looking at doing here and make sure you understand why we chose this remediation. First step for this was preventing exposure. The first exposure pathway is drinking contaminated water. We've already done that. That's what the whole point of that emergency response was. Now we want to make sure we don't have contaminated groundwater moving off the site. As well as removing contaminants from the source. So the technology we're looking at is called air sparge soil vapor extraction. If you're familiar with that Vickers Amico site, where the Chamber of Commerce is located now, that is the same technology they're using in that site. What happens is that the air spark is compressing. That generates air pressure, gets pumped down into the ground, into the ground water, and that air is going to bubble through the ground That will allow those contaminants to evaporate out of the ground water and come up into the surface. The other component is soil vapor extraction, there's a blower. And these wells are installed above the water table, and they're putting a vacuum on this soil to capture whatever vapors are coming out of the ground, as well as vapors coming out of the soil. That goes through vapor treatment and then discharge to the atmosphere. This here are just some photos showing examples of this type of equipment. This is one that we operate in the Central and West. We put an anchor privacy fence around there because of concerns on appearance. This is a shorter fence. All the equipment is housed inside this trailer. In some cases, when the equipment can't be put in the trailer, we use something like a shipping box. Uh, that equipment inside the trailer, that is the lower for the slow river extraction. That is the compressor for the air sparge. This little compressor takes that air, compresses it, Runs it underneath the trailer back up. Underneath the trailer is a cooler because that air gets very hot when it's being compressed. And if we just put it directly into the ground, it actually melts the PVC lines when we use. So we run it through a cooler, goes up to a manifold, and then it goes out to each of the individual wells. Soil vapor extraction runs from each individual well up through the manifold into that vapor treatment vessel, and then out from the atmosphere. If there's noise associated with this, we do have the ability to put mufflers or silencers on it to help reduce the amount of noise, as well as make it look a little better, so we're going to have it inside of a fence or something. This goes down. Connecting the equipment to the well, we're going to have a trench in it. There's going to be a bed of sand in there, we're going to have the lines placed the sand in between, sand above. Backfill and we'll finish the surface off with the angle concrete or asphalt. This is just an example of one of those trenches before we put the lines in. That's an example of those lines being put in the trench. The wells themselves are going to be drilled with large diameter boards. Typically, a well is drilled with that 8 inch bit. These are 18 inch bits. We're still waiting on the final design to determine which size we're going to use, whether it's a 12, a 16, or 18. But those large diameters have an increased surface. It's going to allow us to collect more vapors from the soil <coughs> so that we don't have any vapors leaving the site. One nice thing about drilling, we're easily able to locate these between whatever utilities are on the site. There's gas lines, there's water lines, there's sewer lines. We can easily locate in between. 
Each one of these wells is going to have a radius of influence around them. That's how far out that vacuum or that air is going to reach. And it's very faint. You can see that all the wells are going to be located to make sure that they are able to treat that groundwater and get that contaminant out of the soil before it leaves the site. On the side, this is a little diagram of the two wells. The Sparge well and the Eskin well can be located both inside that. So our next steps, we want to make sure everybody understands what we're going to be doing out there so there's no surprises about the technology we're using. This technology is relatively old, it's tried, it's true, very effective for this type of contamination. We already know it's very effective with that big exam on this site. We believe it's going to work very well for this site. We want to complete that vapor intrusion study. We'd like to get that done yet this fall or early winter. During the same time, we're going to be finalizing the remedial design. Once we have that remedial design final and draft we're going to put it on our website. We're going to let everyone in the community look at it, ask whatever questions they have about what they're planning out there, and let us know if there's any concerns. If everything goes right, we're hoping to have this thing installed in operation spring of next year. I don't expect you to write down the website idea, but if you were to just go to the KDAT website, look for the dry cleaner page, we'll have it posted there. Uh, any questions, you're welcome to talk to the project manager, Mr. Jesse Brown. Jesse. He'll be available afterwards to answer questions as well as <coughs> well. All this information will be on the web page once that draft design is out. So, I know this is a short meeting, but we wanted to inform everybody where we are within this investigation, what our next steps going forward are. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am? What made you decide to test for the vapor intrusion? The concentrations of contaminants in the groundwater, we have a screening level. And based on that screening level, we expect a certain amount to evaporate out of that groundwater and move on through the soil and potentially be a concern to the residents. Are you not testing the area that the main area of the building? This is the main area of the building. It just happens to be that very northwestern portion between the dry cleaner and the tree. Yeah. So we drew that screening line to the big down here. We have copies of these on the maps on the, in the board. You can see where that line is, but it shows that screen level where the concentrations could be high enough to cause a vapor intrusion. It does it hurt that? It's much smaller. It's going to depend on what we find in the initial sampling. Eventually, we will send out this. So we need what time do we do additional sampling? What's the farthest? West Street, Sloan's Rock. Did you test that? The east side of the Yeah, I might kind of clarify one thing. You asked about the area with the bright red on the maps. So the area that's bright red further down is actually where they actually have private water wells. The area we're looking at is up closer to the source area on the vapor intrusion. It's actually going to have higher levels of contamination in the groundwater. It's just that that did not have any private wells. So that's where we're starting. That's the most likely chance of some type of vapor intrusion. So we'll look there first if we find something that's sprayed out. I will say that the contaminant levels that we've seen here are fairly low, so we don't have a high expectation. We just want to make sure we look at every potential path. And what are the What we'll do is if we do find any type of contamination, then we'll get far on that. I know it's our public health officer that can begin with the resident to explain what the potential health concerns were. But they're actually very similar to if somebody was drinking water. And actually, typically, when uh, people 
drink a contaminated water, that's usually the most severe kind uh, as far as the highest risk. So, but we'll work with that homeowner once we get those results, and if there's something there, then we'll be able to answer all those questions. Yes, sir? For remediation, uh, you have the trailers and stuff. Where would that go? Like you said, it's still the plant standard. Normally, would that go like somewhere in the middle of the area, or does it go close to where the initial problem started, or does it go to the edge? Where's that usually happen? This would be located at the tractor unit facility itself. Get out of the way. That is the former driver. And these are going to be located around there. This is just a preliminary figure, trying to get an idea of where it's going to be. Exact applications are final. Um, as for where that trailer is going to be, probably on the east side of that, but possibly behind it. It's pretty easy to dig those doors off the lines in. You want to make sure wherever you're located, it's going to be easy to get to the electrical power needed to operate the system, as well as do our monthly operation maintenance on it. We have already checked the cows out in multiple places, and that's not an issue. As far as surface water, we don't have any contamination in surface water, I believe. Is that we have the boundaries. We do continually sample that as part of our semi annual monitoring. What Joe did at this point here uh, is our remedial approach that we're looking at right now. And we continue to look at the different alternatives. And if there is something different that we decide to go with, then that will be in that final design that you'll be able to look at and make comments on. So if I'm understanding this correct, the new map that is on the map, that that is what you are focusing on right now? Is that is just the vapor intrusion. Where we That's just the vapor intrusion. Okay, so the vapor intrusion does not go further south and west of that. Do you? It's unlike, again, we use those screening levels, and that is what we use to figure where do we need to target our sampling at. Okay. And if we find it in that area, we will step up. Okay. So you will test south of that, south and west of that? South. Or south and east, I'm sorry. Depending on what we find. We wanted to have ours tested. <coughs> we would definitely have to test the resistance. Yeah, we will have within reason. Knowing where you live, yeah, I don't think that's a problem. If somebody was to ask way right down on the end of the well, we do have to limit it because if we were to do all the well or all the properties in there, it's a quarter million dollars to do all the work. So what we're doing is looking at the highest potential. First, and that'd be the first phase. And if we do anything, then we can continue to work our way out. It'd be kind of like we did the groundwater curve. We found the hottest groundwater, and we kind of worked our way out and figured out what's happening. It doesn't do any good if you solve the drinking water problem, but we are creating vapors. Agreed. And the, the reason that we haven't done this yet is because the contamination in the groundwater has been relatively low. So the vapor intrusion hasn't been a high risk, but we want to make sure we check it. Uh, most for years, I would say we have not even done this because the risk for the VI, uh, the intrusion, is such a low level. We want to be protected. We have the ability to go do it. So uh, Joe and his staff are like, let's go ahead and get a VI investigation done. We're, I would say we're being overly cautious to make sure we look at all of the options. Joe's already going through the, the sites that we have in the dry cleaning program, and we've looked for residential wells within two miles of all those sites that use groundwater for their drinking water. So we've actually gone through all those. Uh, they've begun an investigation on, on all of those pretty much. I don't know. I would say between 30 and 50 someplace. I don't know the exact numbers. So let's say 40 give or take. 40 would be between them and not by getting No, they have been identified. Yeah. So we have sites on the backlog list, and 
and that's what we were talking about. Sites that hadn't been investigated. When the Four Seasons site in Gainesville hit, we went and looked at all of those other sites and started investigations on them and have been looking at that to see where the contamination could have been, what drinking water wells were out there. So we have actually had contact with those sites and assessments have already been started and many of them completed already. So because of this, because of some of them we switched up, we've really stepped those efforts up. Also in 2016, uh, we were able to get a new funding source that allowed us to actually be able to afford to do a lot of new those. And so we've got multiple contractors out doing assessments of these kind of sites. Are there going to be any um, health studies done for the residents in any area? Is there going to be, are there going to be any cluster studies or anything like that? Right. Uh, so far, we had those. Our public health officer is the one that answered that question. Unfortunately, she did have a conflict. But do you remember what she said on that? She has looked at the preliminary data. We won't do it. Because we'll ask that question and then we'll put uh, a response out on our website. We'll talk to our communications department to be able to get that second question. I'd say before you leave, make sure we get your phone number and sure. we can make sure we get you the right answer. Wonderful, thank you. How about the, the dry cleaners that there by the Mayfield Bank or Edward Jones? There was enough cleaners there and they pulled your quality down to the groundwater and caused the problem also on the other side of the door. Yeah. You know what that is? This was from the form of these cleaners on the east side? We have not attempted a contamination on that side. We did locate some of our samples over in that area, but we did not detect anything that may be coming from there. I have a question. Uh, because of the cleaners that are on the cancer, my husband just died of a reaction. There was no family history of any cancer. I talked to several of my neighbors. And there's like five people on my house that I was on that have had the kind of cancer. I'm not going to be concerned. I understand the concern. That's a question for Ms. Ahmed. So we'll get in touch with her and we'll take a look at that once again. Let's make sure we get your phone number so we make sure we get all the information. And we'll check with Far when we're able to get back to the office and see what she has planned for this area. I would say almost always Far has gone and looked at those situations. And so I don't know if she's in the process of gathering information. If not, I think we can uh, get back with the community and, and see what we can do. There's been five deaths on her tree, including animals, and they were in the group that did not get the sea water. So yeah, and yeah, we do feel fairly comfortable and confident where the contamination is at, um, but uh, that is one of the things that she'll look at is what's in the contaminator and what's in the general area and try to do a comparison of that. These kind of questions are really difficult. I mean, they're personal, and so we don't want to minimize that at all. So we definitely want to answer your questions and have her take a look at that. She's going to be able to answer those much better than Joe and I can today, so we'll get that information for you. So, she, do you think it would be that her study is supposed to be done by the end of this year, but it does not give you any uh, diagnosis about 2014, and it also does not give you any survey of the individuals we don't <coughs> Yeah, often what they do is that initial study, which is maybe get that preliminary information. And then we do have another side where they're trying to look and see if they're going to do a more detailed study. It is very lengthy and it, it takes a lot of effort with long questionnaires and surveys. Uh, so I'm going to say we will get with Bar and we will get that information and get that conveyed out as to what, when the initial study is going to be. Doesn't 
I would encourage you to be more thorough. I think she would accept that you know, if there's any being put together. Okay. Well, I tell you what, we're going to get you as far in us and we'll get you the information we can and then we determine what that pathway is. So hopefully we can find something that gives some level of confidence. And folks, that FAR does take these things very seriously and does a very good job of it. It is hard to track down the folks that lived here 15, 20 years ago. Uh, if it's rental property versus if somebody owns it, there's a lot goes into this, and she comes from the state. So now, that doesn't mean that we don't care about what's going on in, in town, so we'll try to get as much information as we can. We'll get back to you. You know, I, I know that we all here appreciate you guys coming out. We really do. We appreciate the job that you're doing. and uh, um, But I think that every single person is in this room because we drank that water, water. We bathed in that water. We are reaping, some of us are reaping some severe repercussions from this health-wise. Some have died. And I think that Farah, is that her name? Yes. I think that she definitely needs to put this on the top of her list because right now, my generation that grew up in the 80s and 90s, right now, we have 17 people who died before the age of 40. 17 people. And that's just what cancer. I know of. Cancer. Of cancer. You know, and... So there's something going on here, and I think everybody in this room is in agreement with that. And so, you know, we're not here to beat you up. We want to know the information, you know, and we appreciate the job that you're doing, but we seriously need some answers. And because, you know, we are not just statistics. We are people. And we really need to know that we are being heard as a community. We really do. And, you know, like I said, we appreciate you guys, but... You know, we need some help here to understand and to... So if we could get that going pretty quickly, you know, I, I know that there are protocols. I know that there's, you know, but if we could get that going, that would be amazing. And I think everybody in this room would really appreciate it and, and in the community, in the and affected area. I think one of the things we may be able to do is we'll be able to determine when that's going to be completed. And then we can look at possibly coming back and presenting that and then looking at a path forward. One thing, as, as you look at the maps, and we show the four properties that are in the red, those out of the 196 wells that we sampled, those were the four that were above the EPA drinking water standards. We did hook up a lot of people, 209, 211 properties, and most of those were out of protection. Because well, of those 196 we sampled, the one that were above, the others were meant to be safe for the future. So um, that I want to minimize that. We're going to get the information to the top of our and see what we can do to get that completed and see when that will be completed. I can't rush her without it. I know she's like I said, covering the whole state. But we'll get that information, get a timeline for you, and then we'll talk to her about it. You know, and we can, uh, um, anyone provided their email addresses when they signed in will have that information, so we can probably relay that in email. Um, and if anyone doesn't have an email address, then we can certainly send a letter, just an update on, from, directly from the process. Yeah, that's a good point. The several of you logged in, kind of as we're getting going. Um, if you would sign in on the way out, we make sure we can get that information to you. If you don't have an email, just make sure your phone number is on there, and we will call that in. I know that the community involvement in the area with some of the Facebook pages and the websites is incredible. You guys have done a great job with that information, and so we can help maybe present some of that to you there as well. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so we'll be here, Joe is here, myself, and I'm Bob Turbins, I've met a lot of you at previous meetings. Uh, Jesse is here, and then Ben Hardy, who is our new unit manager that's taken over this program. So with the four of us, we'll be able to answer questions if you'd like to ask us something. Um, 
up front, take the test in private. Feel free to come on up and we'll see what we can get as far as any answers. Thank you for coming out tonight.